unpacking the archive. I want to say from the outset that it has been a privilege for all of us here at the museum to work with the Avery Architecture and Fine Arts Library at Columbia University, our partners in the joint custody of the Frank Lloyd Wright Archive, which we acquired approximately five years ago together, Museum of Modern Art and Columbia University. And particularly grateful for the friendship and knowledge, guidance, and pleasure of working with Carol Ann Fabian, Janet Parks, and Margaret Smith Glass. We're also very thankful to Stuart Graff of the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation, which we have worked with carefully throughout this process. This exhibition is made possible by Hyundai Card, and many of you in this room will not know Ted Chung, uh, the CEO and chair of Hyundai Card, but all I can say is he is an architectural enthusiast, and when he learned of the opportunity to support this exhibition, he was thrilled to do so. We're also grateful to Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III and the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in Fine Arts for their support of this. And no exhibition with Frank Lloyd Wright would be possible without Farrell and Ball. And so we're very happy that they lent us and helped us uh, with the colors. Barry Bergdahl, as many of you know, uh, is also under joint custody uh, between the Museum of Modern Art and Columbia University. We like to think of him as ours, but I'm sure Columbia thinks of him as theirs. Uh, brilliant university professor, but he was joined uh, in this uh, project by Jennifer Gray, research assistant here, and Ariel Dion Noswick. Did I get that right? Uh, I, hope, I hope I didn't, I apologize if I didn't. Curatorial assistant in the Department of Architecture and Design. This exhibition, like many of Barry's, uh, catalyzes our thinking about not only how we look at an architect uh, or a moment, but also how we think about it and engage our public with it. And Wendy Woon, the Edward John Noble Foundation Deputy Director for Education and her team have risen to the occasion and taken advantage of some uh, adjacent spaces to create a, what I think will be a fantastic new opportunity. And so, Wendy, do you want to talk to us about the People's Lab? So when we talk to our visitors and ask them what they want to know about works of art, the first thing they say is we want to know about artists' inspiration or architects' inspiration and their materials and processes. And I think you'll agree, the Frank Lloyd Wright exhibition <clears throat> provides a lifetime of inspiration and really makes you want to pick up a pencil or perhaps rearrange some bricks or materials. Um, so for, for that, we, uh, in conjunction with the exhibition, Frank Lloyd Wright at 150, uh, unpacking the archives, the People Studio, uh, design, Experiment, and Build invites visitors to think like designers and explore architecture through themes connected to community, nature, and the integration of art and life. In this laboratory-like space, people can try their hand at drawing and drafting techniques, create with building and design materials, browse books and videos, and participate in scheduled workshops, conversations, and other experiences developed in collaboration with artists, architects, and designers. Activities and events build on educational principles behind Frank Lloyd Wright's Taliesin Fe uh, Fellowship um, and make connections to the progressive education teaching practices of Black Mountain College with our Rauschenberg and MoMA's own history as a place of learning. This inclusive, collaborative atmosphere of the People's Studio is inspired by these pivotal moments in modern art education and the belief that learning should be achieved through active, hands-on experiences that promote social exchange. I invite you to drop in and be welcomed by one of our knowledgeable facilitators and explore a wide range of self-directed and guided activities. Participants can see individual and collective creations of others exhibited digitally, and there's a full schedule of artist-led workshops from exploring the Freudal gifts and principles of design to the uh, organic architecture of mushroom bricks, or even investigating Frank Lloyd Wright's language of ornament. 
and as well as some educator-led conversations throughout the summer. Plus, the space will be used by our prime time summer camp for adults, uh, 65 plus, and weekly teen programs, and a community studio program for aspiring artists getting or, uh, pursuing their high school equivalency degree. And not to be missed uh, are two fee-based classes uh, e in the evenings led by wonderful Jennifer Gray, who worked with Barry closely on this exhibition, Original Histories, Frank Lloyd Wright, and the Birth of Modernism, and Behind the Scenes, Constructing Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, the studio will be open during museum hours uh, from June 12th through October 1st, and it's free with admission and open to all ages. And in order to serve visitors with hearing loss, the People's Studio uh, will have induction hearing loops for sound amplification. Uh, this initiative really builds on eight years of experimentation. In fact, starting out with Barry uh, and the Bauhaus uh, exhibition many years ago in creating participatory spaces, uh, and it required the expertise of the whole department and many others, but I'd especially like to uh, uh, thank Jenna Madison and Sarah Kennedy, Lara Schweller, Alethea Rockwell, and Sarah Torres from Education, and curators Jennifer Gray and Barry Bergdahl, and our colleagues from Exhibition Design, Graphic Design, AVIT, Digital Media for their generous support. And of course, you can't do this without great funding. And uh, the People's Studio Design Experiment and Build was part of the education at MoMA uh, that's made possible by a partnership with Volkswagen of America. And since 2011, Volkswagen has been a major partner of the Museum of Modern Art and MoMA PS1. It's provided crucial uh, support for MoMA's groundbreaking digital initiatives and activities, as well as the studios. They've been a great experiment. They're great at uh, kind of supporting experimental or emerging uh, different kinds of projects, and we are really grateful for their steadfast support of the studio and other projects. Major support for the studio was also provided by the estate of Susan Sable, and additional support by Christina R. Davis and the Annual Education Fund. So we invite you, it's open all, Sunday, uh, all summer. You don't have to make an appointment, you can just drop in, or you might want to uh, try some of the, uh, check out the schedule and come for one of the talks or uh, workshops. So uh, I turn it back over to Glenn and to Barry, uh, but thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. It's always a pleasure to be uh, with Barry Bergdahl, whose exhibitions are illuminating, challenging, elegant, uh, and always thoughtful. I just wanted to take a moment, Barry, and to salute you on an earlier show, uh, which had to do with Latin American architecture, which if I'm right, the catalog to that exhibition uh, has just won the Philip Johnson Award from the Society of, Ameri of Architectural Historians. So, felicitations and congratulations. <laughs> Friends from Mexico were yeah. here. <laughs> so, I don't mean to embarrass you, but uh, it just one more reflection of the work you do. So, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, is not unfamiliar to the Museum of Modern Art. This is the fifth, sixth, seventh exhibition we've devoted to him. What did we come up with, Jennifer? I think 12 or 13 or 16. Uh, if you come at the exhibition from the uh, sequence followed, like flanking the garden, you'll come upon a secondary uh, title wall, which has two things on it. One, it has an 18 minute loop of film that we uh, digitized from home movies that came with the archive that are really quite fun to see and you see Frank Lloyd Wright drawing. But above it is a chronology of Frank Lloyd Wright at MoMA. So it is every time that Frank Lloyd Wright has been exhibited at MoMA, beginning with, of course, his uh, appearance in the inaugural show of 1932 that we call by shorthand the international style, uh, where he was very prominently displayed and where he was infuriated by MoMA for the first time, to be associated with all those young upstarts from Europe, uh, and then carries around into a dot, 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 because of course now with the archive here, this is not, this is neither the first nor the nor the last, and it is only a sample of the way that uh, at uh, MoMA we can recontextualize and continue to ask new questions about uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, even now a half century after his death. Um, but to your, to your question, 
from the moment we started the conversations with the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation and began to delve into the museum's own archives, it came as a surprise even to me, and I thought I knew the exhibition history of this place in relationship to architecture and design, that Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright, not Mies van der Rohe, as you would expect, has been the most frequently exhibited and lionized architect uh, in the museum's history. Caroline Fabian from the Avery Fisher Library has just Avery arrived. Carol, we're, <laughs> we, we were uh, saluting you in Columbia for the partnership. It's great that you're here and welcome. <laughs> uh, if, if I remember correctly, the last major show here was about 25 years ago. The last major show, we did a small one to welcome the archive in 2014, but the last major one was in 1994. It was actually Terry Riley's first major show. Uh, he, it was already under work, in the works when he came and inherited, so it's been, it was exactly 20 years from his huge retrospective drew very heavily on these same archives, but of course uh, going to find them in Arizona and Wisconsin. And exactly 20 years later, we did the first small welcoming the archive to, uh, to New York exhibition. It was that exhibition that brought us Peter Reed, now the Senior Deputy Director uh, for Curatorial Affairs and a brilliant architectural historian in his own right. So uh, we have a deep <laughs> affiliation with Frank Lloyd Wright. So what is there new to say about Frank Lloyd Wright? I mean, here we are extensively exhibited, uh, known well, 150 years on. What is there new and what was the strategy to unpacking the archives? Mm -hmm. Well, for one, even with, we have Rauschenberg up now <laughs> as well, and uh, every X number of years we reconvene to think about Picasso, so I think every generation has new questions and new views, even on well-known material, but inevitably an archive of this hugeness uh, is going to have some, uh, some new revelations, some new documents, uh, both documents related to well-known moments and ones that might seem to be, uh, to be minor. But I think the key thing here, and I could begin to recite the things that I've learned and that I, there have been many specialists in right in the exhibition even this morning who say they're learning things, so that is very gratifying. But I think the, the key thing in this show was to invite a group of people who have very interesting inquiries into major issues in modern and contemporary architecture to use the archive, to find things that intrigue them, to delve into right, uh, and in a sense to announce that with the much greater accessibility of this archive now in the Avery Library and the much greater uh, prominence that we can have at MoMA in displaying it, uh, the archive is here and open. Uh, and it is open to new questions and to new people. That's why it was very important to me in this exhibition that we uh, invite younger scholars, different voices, and uh, people who didn't necessarily already have their Frank Lloyd Wright credentials. We could have easily filled that space three times over with people who have written two, three, four uh, important books on Frank Lloyd Wright, but I think that would not have announced that Frank Lloyd Wright is open to new, uh, to new voices, and you don't have to commit yourself to writing the next monograph on a building or Frank Lloyd Wright. Perhaps uh, in the future, uh, particularly in the future of the presence of the architecture and design collections here at MoMA, we'll see Frank Lloyd Wright integrated in ways that haven't so much happened in the past, that we won't always be showing Wright monographically. Uh, I had the, we talked so much, you know this, Carol Ann knows it, when we were uh, making our proposal to the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation about what it would mean if we took over custody of the uh, archive. And one thing that always got me salivating was saying, well, we also, we have the, we have the Mies van der Rohe archive. What does it mean when we have Mies and Frank Lloyd Wright together? For instance, I would really like to hang Friedrichstrasse. Uh, which I think is a drawing that both inspired and drove Frank Lloyd Wright crazy next to some of his work. So there's Stay the tuned, you'll no <laughs> doubt see that happening. So there, there's the beginning of the, uh, uh, of the ability to put Wright more thoroughly in dialogue with other materials that are here, either at MoMA or, of course, the extraordinary collections uh, of Avery. So that's a, a very powerful um, setting for him. And so I was determined to hear, uh, this is an exhibition like many that I've done that is, I 
something takes a certain number of risks. We'll ask people to see if they have something interesting to say about right. Go, go poke around in the archive, see what you want to explore, and let's see what you come out with. So we didn't know when we invited the, these people were not uh, approved on their object list for each gallery. So each gallery is an experiment. It's up to you to go up and see which ones are more convincing, more compelling, open more doors. Um, but that was very important. This is an advertisement for the archive is here. Please come and think and work with it. Well, I like a lot the way you brought the Avery into the museum. That is, it, there are the traditional strategies of museum display, but there are other strategies that make the space of the exhibition feel much more like a research library, a place where you look, you think, you might actually spend a lot of time reading, imagining. So this idea of the space of the exhibition as different than a more traditional kind of exhibition interests me. And I, and I wonder if you were thinking about that in relationship to how to knit together these effectively 14 mini exhibitions. What holds them together for us as, a view, as viewers and participants? I'm going to backtrack a second from the question to give a prelude and then poke me if I don't answer it. But um, key to understanding the exhibition is indeed these films that we produced uh, in which each of the scholars, museum conservator Ellen Moody is here this morning, is seen in their place of work so that visitors to the exhibition understand what it means to be in the conservation lab and what's at stake. But they also understand what it means to be in an archive. How does a historian, it doesn't have to be a historian, but in this case it, it is, how does a historian confront an architectural drawing and ask questions about it? So we hope also that those are not only behind the scenes, but they're a little bit of an owner's manual to each room. How do, you, how do I now, as a viewer, work with these drawings? What, I see this particular person intrigued, moving the drawings around on the table, gesticulating at them, telling us a way to look at them, and then I can extend that lesson to try to follow their thought process here. Both personifies the interpretation that's there, but it also offers a point of entry into an architectural drawing, which is not always um, easy to use. That approach did leave us with the problem that we were not trying to put together a total Frank Lloyd Wright. And we also didn't say, would you pick something from 1910? You've got the 20s, you got the 30s. So we don't have a necessary chronological sweep. So there are, uh, down on the cutting room floor, countless versions of the ways that these sections would talk to one another. We did bring everybody back together, uh, at least on one occasion. And so they heard the way things were evolving uh, and us listening to people talking about their they're working on their modules, uh, unpacking their key objects, began to suggest relationships that were coming out. And it perhaps also uh, a bit turned up the volume on those relationships as people became intrigued what, what the other, this uh, sudden community of new scholars on Frank Lloyd Wright, what they were doing. So relationships began to emerge. So we tried to keep it vaguely chronological. They, it's a little bit like that, uh, like a sort of game of I don't know, sort of a kind of running game because you have to start over again each time. So, but as you move through the show, the key object is becoming later in date. So the, you don't have to go back to the beginning quite every time. Uh, but there are certain themes that emerge down, if you go down the left-hand side of the exhibition, it turns out that the, sec the section, this wonderful conversation between Jennifer Gray and Teresa O'Malley, who's a, a historian of the landscape profession, of, of gardening, of uh, plant material, of horticulture, uh, looking at right and plants, just exactly what you would expect, but she finds actually a very nuanced view besides the fact that she finds planting lists and she starts to put right in relationship to all sorts of issues about what is a native plant, what is an exotic plant, what is a naturalized plant. Then Juliet looks at the little farm unit. She has extraordinary uh, revelations there about internal to her section about the relationship of this guy Davidson to Wright's thinking about farming. But that then extends the plants now into the working landscape, which uh, Jennifer's section has also looked at sort of land as infrastructure. And then you move into the next section, which has to do with who was actually on this land before we all arrived, the Native Americans. So the next section is a doctoral student at uh, CUNY who was here for a year as an intern, uh, working on right and Native American culture. Uh, and suddenly you think, oh wait, all that stuff about what is a native plant, what is not a native plant, that actually 
that wasn't really what we were expecting, but it starts to uh, create some unexpected resonances, and then we move into Mabel Wilson's section on the Rosenwald School for African American Children. So, um, without necessarily saying on the wall text, this section is talking to the next one in this way. There are many relationships, depending on the way that you crisscross through those spaces, that start to emerge. One is struck, I mean, the, even though the goal of the exhibition was not to provide an overarching reading of Frank Lloyd Wright in any comprehensive way, it does cover many of the most crucial issues in Wright's practices, internationalism, uh, education, which I think emerges perhaps um, especially strongly here as something that he thought about. It wasn't just uh, young children, older, ch you know, older adults. Uh, he 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 seems to have had a predilection for taking on campuses and trying to think through how to educate. Do you want to elaborate on that at all? Yes, but you're making me regret that we didn't have a section on education per se. But perhaps it's the nature of this exhibition that some of these themes, as you say, weave through, and that the potentialities for further treatments and further questions, I think, are there. Uh, it is absolutely multifold. Of course, there is this uh, momentary engagement with the whole issue of the Rosenwald schools, which is a fascinating episode in itself. But that episode comes right on the eve of Wright setting up the Taliesin Fellowship, where his architectural office and his property and his way of life, uh, all of those uh, blur. They're all living together, they're a community, uh, they're also producing the architecture, but they're apprentices, and they're not only apprentices who do the drawings, but they also go out and farm the fields in the, uh, in the, in the morning, so there's a kind of American communal uh, aspect to that. Uh, and as you say, he did design whole campuses. We only have one of the spectacular drawings for uh, Florida Southern University, which would merit a a later treatment in much greater detail because it's a very fascinating project for this university in an orange grove. Um, but like so many of the educational projects, and they occur in other places as well in the exhibition, they involve the idea that building was learning. So the even down to the self-build systems at the end, uh, this sense that architecture is by its nature an educational activity. So. What were the surprises for you? I mean, when you had a chance to know the archive perhaps better than anyone uh, as you went into this, uh, but were there real revelations? Were there, did, did the unpacking produce utterly unexpected moments for you when, when you saw something about right that you couldn't have imagined before? I think my panic is that there are all the ones that I haven't discovered yet because we, <laughs> I don't know it better than anyone. That's up to any, Carol Ann. I don't know it help. better than anyone. I was only, I had a slight running start because I'm not a right scholar in comparison to the others who came and worked in the archive. So I'm still uh, learning a great deal and I'm learning the extent to which the uh, sort of set pieces in which I've always in an undergraduate lecture course placed right don't necessarily work because they move, they lose all the connections. Uh, so some of those con connectivities, but um, things, the, the joy and the frustrations of an archive is the book's already gone to press and Janet Parks phones and she says, there's a file that has material for you with your mile high skyscraper in the press conference, but it's not filed under mile high, it's filed under something completely bizarre. And suddenly you've got a whole new file with telegrams from some of the most famous engineers of the period, etc. So the, the archive, even though many people have worked on it in uh, for many decades, Anthony Lofsen, who was here earlier this morning, indexed the correspondence many years ago, so people have been working to organize and uh, and guide us through it for a very long time, it continues to uh, unfold uh, new experiments. I did not know the drawings that are kind of the articulating joint between the ecologies and landscape section and the farm section, which are by Masselink. For those of us who were at MoMA, we all know that photograph of Curator's Terror, of Frank Lloyd Wright still drawing on his drawings while they're being pinned to these boards at MoMA when he a truck came with no warning and dumped something completely different than the checklist that had been submitted ahead of time. And the man patiently standing behind him is a guy named Eugene Maslink, who was an assistant and designer in his own right, 
uh, those drawings between those two sections are him trying to develop a language of form out of analyzing cacti. And they are, we could float them up into another department and put them in the graphics, you know, in, in a graphic display or put them in relationship to uh, experiments with finding the building blocks of abstract form in the painting galleries. They're extraordinary. Well, you mentioned Mile High Skyscraper. It, Wright seems to have been able to work on at least two dimensions. He could go vertical as high as one could go, but he was also capable of going very broad horizontally, uh, broad acres mm -hmm. being just one yeah. uh, small uh, example of that. And I'm interested in these different registers that he was exploring and, and how the issue of urban planning, urban density plays into his work. Wright's a very, very contradictory figure. and. Three years ago, when we did the first exhibition, which subtitled was Frank Lloyd Wright in the City, Density versus Dispersal, I wanted to just tackle head on something that's very hard to resolve in looking at his work, which is this horizontal and vertical. Uh, the question there was, how do we understand this person who hypothesizes a city of low density and no limits? Many have wanted to see it as a forerunner of sprawl. That's a long debate. In Broadacre, first exhibited just a few hundred yards from here in the Rockefeller Center still under construction and he continues to work on that project for the rest of his life it becomes the diagrams in the book Living City and at the same time he's so uh, enamored of his principle of the taproot skyscraper that he keeps wanting to make it higher and f push it further technically and extrude it until he gets this mile-high skyscraper so you know, what, what does the guy want? He wants, he wants no density uh, or he wants total density. Uh, so is, I'm not even sure if he's working on two registers. He seems to be uh, contradicting himself. So in this exhibition as well, I think we allow those contradictions to come right to the surface so that we can grapple with them and we don't always try uh, to resolve them. Uh, ooh, those of you who have been up have seen, and if you, when you go back up, you might see the section where I try to unpack the Mount Alhai skyscraper is right next to Neil Levine unpacking a very different type of engagement with the city, the Monona Terrace project, and others that are very uh, horizontal. And again, how do you, how do you resolve these, uh, these two visions? Um, I can give you a pat answer to explain it away, but I think we're, I think Wright is, intriguing because he's like all of us. He's actually filled with internal contradictions because he's, uh, he's so experimental that he is also very contradictory. And with that, we'll turn it over to all of you to ask any questions of Barry that you might have. I should say I'm the one on stage, but this would be impossible without Jennifer Gray, who uh, is looking forward to next week to unchaining herself from our continual association in this. <laughs> yes. Hi, Beth Harpaz, AP. Um, you know, for the person who's not a designer, an engineer, a scholar, obviously who's coming to this exhibit, just a lot of average people who are interested in Frank Lloyd Wright, why 150 years after his birth are we still so fascinated by this guy? Uh, I mean, I'm a travel editor. You try to get a tour of a Wright house. Price Tower or Talias, and you got to sign up two months in advance. They, they sell out. People travel across the country to see them. Why? Well, I think partly we're still in the aftermath of the 1950s when Wright was on television all the time. And in that think I, moment, I think he embedded himself as an absolutely intriguing, uh, intriguing personality uh, that, that sticks with people. Uh, your question actually seemingly straightforward is a complicated one. I'm fascinated by how it is that at the beginning of the first decade of the 20th century, Wright's houses were so radical in their design and so unusual that a uh, wonderful old book on him by Leonard Eaton that looked at Frank Lloyd Wright's clients, and that is a very, very important issue. The clients are as much a part of this as the uh, architect, as always. Those clients often recounted that they liked to take the back route to the train station in the morning so they could avoid some of those conversations about why are you living in that strange house on the corner of it, you know, X and Y, that those very houses now 
are houses that people want to go to because they're cozy, they look like home, they slightly nostalgic. Uh, the registers, I'm not sure that the registers in which we appreciate Ryder necessarily uh, still bound to the uh, to the moment of um, to the moment of conception, but it is true that right. We've said it over and over again in the preparations for this exhibition, and I can't think of another, is I believe the only architect who is more popular with the general public than he is with practicing architects today. Part of it, I think, is to build on Barry's observation about how Wright, if you think about it, was not a man of television, but took to television. He had the, the character and personality to become a public figure in, in a new kind of way. Uh, and so that the presence of right disseminated way beyond circles of architecture. There's a so the character, the story, the man exists in parallel to this protean talent that managed to produce a career that was almost a century long. Right, like so that duration, the combination of the duration, the inventiveness. Uh, and a personality that he cultivated. I mean, you just have to look at, at an image behind us, uh, that he was well aware that how he presented himself had an impact on how at least the public would understand his architecture. And, and so your question is an apt one. Uh, right at 150, it feels to us, is still as interesting as he was at 100, and maybe even more interesting than he was at 50. As much as the the contradictions and the tensions in Wright's personality can be explained or dealt with simply biographically. I think that what one has with the vantage point of 150 is also to see them at cross currents of, of the culture, both nationally and internationally at any given moment. Uh, and so I think now with that greater distance, as eccentric and highly personal as Wright was, he's also a, a intriguing mirror, not a direct mirror, a slightly distorting mirror, but a mirror for many big issues. Uh, and so some of the things that are chosen here, I think, are resonate with issues today. Juliet's section on the farm, this is an issue. Where should, farm, where should we get our food from? Should we be shipping it across the country? Should we be getting it locally? Uh, if somebody's proposing a mile high skyscraper, you all, uh, you know, we've got one under construction next door, and uh, there are about four others on 57th Street. So the issue of building height is a very, very contemporary issue. So many of these issues are not simply um, embedded uh, in the historical past. I had one thought that just occurred to me that I wanted to uh, add on to your question about the, the reputation. In the late teens and 20s, Wright was not so much in view. And he comes back into view in the 30s in very interesting ways. And key is falling water. And I think, I'm not a psychologist, but I think somehow the image of that house over the waterfall in nature is so powerful. And of course, it appears on Time Magazine when Wright is man of the year. Um, that image is so powerful. The desire, that one would probably need a two-year advance appointment, I don't know, but to get into falling water. Um, and I think that falling water is one of the, th and that was the subject of a monographic exhibition when the house was new here at MoMA. That house is in the imaginary of the entire world, the idea of living floating above a waterfall. Yes, please. Um, hi, uh, my name is Russell Kahn. I'm the editor of a children's newspaper called Newsomatic, read by uh, thousands of uh, schools, elementary and middle school across the country. And I want to ask you, basically, what should children, young readers, learn uh, about the impact of Frank Lloyd Wright and whether you think the celebrity status of, of Mr. Wright will carry on to future generations? I think there's a tension in your question because uh, I think that the celebrity uh, I partly wanted polemically to show with the What's My Line episode where Wright's profession is broadcast to the home audience since he's the mystery guest as world's greatest architect, that this was a new profession. There are architects and then it's much more trying to be the world's greatest architect. Uh, but in a way, the forerunner of the star architect of today. Uh, and this has been a polemic of mine for a long time. I think the star architect phenomena is an extremely unfortunate one because it uh, creates an idea that architecture is something for celebrity culture, inaccessible, and is the opposite of what we would hope children who are sophisticated enough to have their own newspaper uh, would engage 
engage with architecture in a really meaningful, hands-on way. So I think uh, this exhibition doesn't go back over the incident of Wright in the famous Froebel blocks, but actually we have in the, in the collection now a complete set of the Froebel blocks, um, and I'm sure that they're going to be brought out in relationship to Frank Lloyd Wright in some future context. But the idea that Wright was interested in systems that anyone could understand, uh, that you could uh, learn a system and begin to manipulate it, he always hoped he would put enough uh, into the DNA of it that you couldn't get a monster out of it, that you would still get a work that had Frank Lloyd Wright's principles. Um, but I think that the idea that Wright has that is almost the antithesis of his celebrity culture, that anybody can take the building blocks of something, be it a garden, a building, and begin to play with it in creative ways without following what he would think of as artificial models. This has to do with his very Emersonian love of nature. Question in the back I saw. Yes, please. Paul Clemens with Archiphoto. I was just wondering if you could maybe comment a little bit about the placement of the Mies images on the section of the Mile High. Yes. Um, as I said, we were fantasizing about being able to cross-reference those, but it's not simply out of personal pleasure. Uh, so you have there two, Mies image, uh, two key Mies images. One is the Friedrichstrasse skyscraper project of about 1921. That was a image that was very widely circulated in the architectural press, so it was known to write that this young German had proposed a completely glazed uh, building that was fantasizing on the American capacity of the curtain wall. Uh, and that also was a, a, a drawing that uh, here in the museum, Philip Johnson and Henry Russell Hitchcock celebrated as part of uh, Mies van der Rohe's incredible genius of realizing a skyscraper that was unburdened by the historicism and the classical uh, learning that America seemed so intrigued by. So the idea that the Europeans could create a better skyscraper than the Americans who had invented the form, all of that carries with the mythology around that unrealized um, design. Frank Lloyd Wright responds to it almost immediately. The project for St. Mark's in the Bowery, I think, is in part uh, a reaction to Mises' fame and wants to say, no, I have my own system. It's based on a taproot. It's much more spatially complex. So there's already a rivalry with this person that he doesn't know at all. When Mies arrives in America in 1938 and takes up his job as director of architecture at what was then the Armour Institute today, the Illinois Institute of Technology, he is, in Frank Lloyd Wright is invited to present uh, Mies van der Rohe to the American public, to the Chicago public for the first time. And unlike me, he gave a very short introduction. He stands up and says, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mies van der Rohe. Without me, there would be no Mies van der Rohe. So this is the beginning of this rivalry. Uh, and by, uh, my section then continues with why the mile high then with all of this, um, the, the convention hall, where suddenly Mies, Mies is the architect of horizontality and Wright is the architect of great verticality, big surprise. But they're both fighting for two things. They're fighting to get their foot in the building boom that happens with the election of Richard Daly as mayor of Chicago, and they're fighting the historiographical legacy of the Chicago School because the historians have just begun to talk about the second Chicago School of which Mies van der Rohe, not Frank Lloyd Wright, is the leader. And so Wright wants to say, no, I'm the inheritor of Sullivan. I can build Chicago's greatest skyscraper. Even though nobody's paying for it, I can conceive it. And so that's why those Frank Lloyd Wright Mies drawings, and as you can see, they're also both masters of the oversized polemical drawing that you can't forget. <laughs> we'll take another question if there is one. Yes, right there in the middle, please. We'll have a, we'll have a microphone to you in a second. Yes, that, uh, sorry. You seem to suggest that uh, Wright's uh, uh, reputation in architectural circles is uh, not as high as it is amongst the general public. Can you talk a little bit more about that? How do architects today uh, evaluate his uh, legacy and perhaps the negative element of it. I'm, I'm curious what they don't like about it. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think, I, I think everyone respects Wright, but not many contemporary architects don't necessarily have a love affair with Wright that the general public does. We could even wonder if that's part of the problem. But um, I think also uh, you know, Wright spaces often tend to be, I'm not talking about the great workroom of the Johnson Wax, but they tend to be relatively uh, small scale, um, very uh, intimate, they're not at all in that sense related to the type of spaces that we want to live in today or that uh, are uh, created. I think the whole, eth the, one of the things I'm trying to do with this exhibition is make much more complicated and complex Wright's relationship to nature. So I think that nature worship, which is of course so embedded in 19th century romanticism, is precisely what divides the public from the profession. Yet in a moment when biomimicry, the possibility of imitating nature in computer programs. Uh, many of these issues are very, very central to architecture. Uh, if you look at those aspects in right, there is actually an extraordinary resonance. And I, so I hope that there will be some discovery uh, that right is perhaps more relevant to contemporary concerns uh, than many professional architects might think in some of the unexpected drawings and aspects that are in the show. Not that I would in any way want people to start a Frank Lloyd Wright revival, but I think there would be a much greater sympathy with the complexity of the uh, figure and a recognition that he was grappling with issues that have something to do with things that concern practitioners today. Barry, thank you. That's a perfect way to end. Uh, what a great exhibition. Uh, Barry will be around if you have other questions you'd like to ask him individually, but thank you all for joining us for this great show. Thank you, Glenn.